Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Linux Lads podcast. I'm your host for this episode. I am Connor. I am Mike. And I'm Shane. It's been an exciting couple of weeks since we were last on. Let's just get going with the episode. If anyone who was paying attention to our last episode, we now have an Azire VPN coupon code. So if you go to the Azire VPN website, as you're checking out um, for the three-month plan, if you click on the add code button and add in Linux lads when ordering, you get 30% off. Azire VPN offer OpenVPN and they also offer WireGuard, which is this new hotness in the Linux world, which is part of the reason we, we kind of reached out to them and asked, could we get a discount code for our podcast? So that is, again, if you go to the their three-month plan and click add code, uh, put in Linux Lads, you get 30% off three months. So now going into the discussion, um, the first one uh, on the list that I'm going to pick off is LibreOffice have released a new 6.2 release with the new notebook bar. Um, from any videos and renderings I've seen of this, it seems to emulate the ribbon interface from uh, Microsoft Office. Not quite the same, but the same basic idea. It's also not enabled by default. So for the people who don't like change and are going to be all uh, torches and pitchforks around about this uh, and saying, oh, what are they doing with change? And it, you have to go to the menu and change the interface. So it's all they're doing is they're adding a new user interface option onto that list. Um, what are you guys thought on this new notebook interface? I looked at it uh, briefly. So uh, it used to be there for a while. Oh, it's been there for a while. It was buried in like the menu that said, uh, uh, that said uh, these are, these features are, uh, I'm missing a word here. Basically, it was features that were not meant to be tested by the white pop, uh, white white audience, just by uh, pe- just by people who were really interested Pre- in it. Pre-release features or something. Yeah, like that. I'm missing a stupid word. It's somewhere in the show notes anyway. Um, uh, yeah, this is really extremely professional, isn't it? Experimental. That's the word. So, the the notebook bar was there or has been there as an as an experimental feature. Now they put it into the menu. You, as Connor said, you have to disable. You have to enable it. It's not enabled by default. I've tried it. There are a few variations of of it. Uh, one of them looks pretty much like the Microsoft Windows uh, Microsoft Office menu. Uh, I used uh, I use uh, LibreOffice, especially Calc, uh, f- very often, like daily, and I don't think I'll be switching because I really don't care much what it looks like, and I already have a workflow, so it's not for me. But I think it's extremely beneficial for people who are coming from uh, from uh, Microsoft Office because it's gonna be familiar to them. So I like the way they did it. I wouldn't be bothered if I had to go and disable it, but I like the way that it's there. I like that it's accessible, and I think this is a positive change altogether. Yeah, um, I haven't actually used it myself, but I have looked at a lot of the screenshots, and um, I do, I do like it, um, it because the LibreOffice UI for me was never the prettiest thing ever. Like I, I didn't, I haven't ever really liked it. I found the icons and the layout and everything a little bit fugly. So this is quite nice. This is a nice change. It makes it look a bit more sleek, a little bit more uh, modern, which is the important thing. Definitely borrowing a lot from Microsoft Word, but sure, like nobody can deny that many Microsoft Office programs are pretty good and they're kind of worth their salt and they're the the kind of Office standard in the world. So um, or the productivity standard anyway. Um, so yeah, I like I like it. I don't know. Um, I have yet to use it properly. So that could change when I actually get down to using it. To echo some of Shane's points there, yeah, I've, I've basically just judging this off screenshots and um, videos of them announcing the feature or demonstrating the feature. I've not actually uh, used it myself because I don't think uh, I'm on uh, Ubuntu 18.10 here and I don't think the official version has been updated to, uh, or the version that comes with Ubuntu has been updated to 6.2 as of yet. Um, so I don't think I've been able to had the opportunity to try this. But uh, when uh, um, Microsoft 
um, came out with the ribbon interface um, for Microsoft Office. I think it was uh, Office 2007 is, uh, according to my recollection, could be wrong. I actually, once, it, there was a bit of a learning curve, but once I got used to it, I actually found that I preferred it. So going back to LibreOffice or uh, OpenOffice or whatever it was at the time, and being the having the old tree like menus, I actually found them as a step back rather than a step forward. Some people may disagree with me. This is my own subjective opinion. Um, so I I'm quite happy that they're they're cleaning up the interfaces as, as well. Uh, I find that the old interface before this uh, new no- notebook interface was very cluttered. I found this kind of streamlines things, especially for for people who literally only do about four or five things when they're um typing up a um uh, a an office document or when they're doing a spreadsheet or whatever, whether it's just I'm typing up this thing and all I want to do is change a couple of fonts or I want to add a couple of images in and that's basically all I want to do. Then rather than hunting and pecking through menus, this just puts them up on tabs. So, oh, I want to adjust the font, I'll click on this tab. Oh, I want to add a a photo, I'll click on this tab. It for those kind of users which i believe is like 80 to 90 percent of users who just want to do simple things with their office suite this is great because it simplifies the interface for the people who really want powerful features you can literally um it's a checkbox you can go back and say i don't like this um or it's not even enabled by default so it's not like you have to disable anything you just stick with the way it is at the moment and if you want, you can go into the interface and select it. And as soon as 6.2 it comes out for 18.04 or when I see it appearing, I will be switching to it and seeing if I like it. Um, may report back that I absolutely hate it, but it does seem like a good change for me. Yeah, well, if you had Arch like yours truly, you'd be already on it, of course. Uh, it's uh, Ooh, it's there. I, it's not. It's not just 6.2. Dot two, it's six dot two dot zero dot three, I think. So, like, well ahead of you. I do have Antigos on my laptop. <laughs> Just say, yeah, you'll you'll be seeing it soon, though. Then, oh, you probably already have it. You've been out arched. <laughs> oh no, he didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Any, anyone else want to pick one of the topics? Oh, there was an interesting news that I don't know about you guys, but I've not expected this. The Raspberry Pi Foundation opened a store in Cambridge in the UK, uh, still in Europe, that uh, that looks a bit like the Apple Store. And uh, that was something that came for me out of the blue. And I first thought, what the hell are they doing? And then I thought, oh, hold on a second. This is a very good idea because I... Uh, in my retail experience, I actually sold quite a few Raspberry Pis in a shop, and the the it it was all uh, it was most of them were to people who came with their kids, so the parents and children, and they like it's hard for an uh, for, to to explain it to a parent like what can you do with this. And if you have it already set up, and if you and I, I've never been to the store. And I assume that they'd be having things on display. It would, it can help extremely for not only the children to see what it does, but also for the parents who obviously are paying for it. And the fact that it's going to look like an an Apple store, or that, uh, that uh, basically in the way that it's going to be very slick and it's going to be very professional, and uh, that that can only like make the make the experience with the Raspberry Pi better and um, I just hope that one day maybe they'll open one in Dublin also the people were quite skeptical like does it make sense in this day and age to open a physical store but uh, this is not just a shop to me this is more akin to like games workshop you know guys uh, you know they do they have got their games you can buy them but they can also you can also go there or kids can go there and build the uh, whatever you call those things that they that they play with right they can construct uh, the battle Warhammer. scenes yeah that that kind of thing i've never been into it but you know kids go there and paint the figurines and everything right so it, and that that brand or and that company is thriving so i think if they if they pull off something like this as well with raspberry pi it can only be a good thing 
Yeah, just when you mentioned Games Workshop there, it was, I used to be actually a hardcore Warhammer 40k guy. Um, I have a big box on top of my wardrobe with just boxes of Space Marines and shit like that. Um, yeah, so OG nerd. But um, I recently noticed they've actually rebranded to just Warhammer. They've dropped the whole Games Workshop thing. But anyway, that's a side chapter there. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's 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 not so much just a place to sell Raspberry Pis. It's a place to promote the the whole ecosystem and the whole brand and to you know have a physical place where parents and kids can go and then they can see it in action and they can get everything they need right then and there without having to order it online it's a good idea for me i like it and i think they should open more of them um whether it makes money or not not is not the point because raspberry pi is a foundation and a, like a charitable foundation so you know, the, the profit making aspects and how many pies they're going to sell isn't really relevant there. So, yeah, I agree with you. They still have to make enough money not to go bust. But yeah, in, in principle. I am. Um, yeah. The whole thing of this, of just going in, being in there and educating people, having kids come in with their parents um, is a very good idea. I mean, I've. I think there was a blog that they posted and they've fought a lot of photographs of the, the front of the store with their logo on the front and the various uh, tables and their setup and everything. And I mean, for me, for people who, who are familiar with the Raspberry Pi, this may seem obvious, but from the photos for moms or dads or whatever, as they're coming in with their kid and they're not that familiar with the Raspberry Pi, it, it's a, uh, I don't, just noticed that it's possibly a revelation of the whole thing of because they have pies and they're just hooked up to monitors and I'm sure people who are used to desktops and towers are going to go okay yeah uh, that's fine that's the monitor but where's the computer and then what, and they're like no no the computer is, is that board with all the wires sticking out of it um, that's literally just sticking in front of the monitor and they're like wait what um, yeah is that whole thing of it is very educational to see it in in person just to say this little thing the, um this is basically the the 2d dimensions of a credit card i mean it's it's a bit thicker uh with all these components on top of it but it's it's like the the uh the width and the the uh the height of it are pretty much like credit card size i say this credit card size thing is powering this monitor and you're able to open up a web browser and go to whatever you want you want you're able to go to twitter or whatever you want to do um and you can also do coding on it as well so it's also an educational tool to see it physically i think is a very good um selling point well if it if it was only a computer that would be one thing but of course like the main educational thing about the raspberry pi is physical computing so you can plug it plug a lot of things into it you can create circuits you can uh, you can uh, basically build whatever as far as your materials imaginations and lo- and, and the laws of physics allow you to go so for that purpose like to to sell to sell a small computer is not as difficult but to explain to the parents that yes you can definitely take a bunch of wires and and a shield or and and uh, and a board and to show it to to them how it all goes together that's i think that's uh priceless plus um i've been looking at the photos while you guys were talking there and the store looks nice like it looks very classy yeah, apple, and apple-esque yeah it, like i think it has just enough to set it apart though it doesn't look quite as polished as an apple store but it still looks really tasteful and it looks really kind of modern um, I really like the way they've they've done it, like with the, the you know the black sign and the white lettering and everything. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah, it does look good. So I think in other news, um, Fedora are designing a new logo. I think the primary motivation behind this is they're saying that at the moment their logo is not monochrome, so the, it can't really be translated to um a, a monochrome logo is very useful because you can um you can stick it on a t-shirt or you can do whatever or even let's say if they're printing off in grayscale or whatever uh, whatever they're to have the logo still recognizable it's very useful to have a monochrome logo um and there so they have a few proposed designs um and i think the 
is it the designer Mike you were saying um, the, is actually uh, Irish from the look of things so yay Irish co- Irish coders <laughs> and uh, I, the, the design team the federal design team uh, lead I think she's Irish her name is Maureen and uh, she has a she has a blog post that where she puts the where where she uh, reports on the progress of the design process and it's quite interesting read as well. So there's your our Irish plug right there. So yay, champion the Irish people. Good on you, Maureen. Um, but getting back on topic, um, I'm looking down through some of the uh, proposed uh, designs and uh, some of them were actually look pretty cool. Um, I haven't yet decided whether I like uh, if you go it'll be in the show notes but um, there's candidate one and there's candidate two and, I'm, and some of them I kind of they're they are very similar there's a, a kind of a subtle difference between the two um, but I think I'm kind of slightly leaning towards candidate one at the moment but I could change my mind in a second <laughs> because they are very similar I think the candidate two has been dropped now uh, if you scroll oh, a little it? bit down um, and they are now elaborating on candidate one so they then they split I think they split uh, at least as of the last blog post uh, they split candidate one into three different candidates that uh, to me are like almost identical it's very subtle differences between the two, the two as you're scrolling down it's kind of uh, we kind of like this design for, uh, of the font for the E and this design for the A and the, what you think between these it's it's very subtle um, so they're going down into refinement of the logo which I suppose is a good thing which means they've, they've, they've um, kind of settled on the broad strokes of the logo it looks like it's in professional hands so they uh uh, and that's a that's a that's a good thing. So they they kind of painstakingly painstakingly judge uh, which way a little bit of a letter goes. So I can see that it's in a good hands. And Fedora, whatever they choose, they are going to end up with a good logo. Yeah, I've been reading through uh, Maureen's blog here, and it's uh, it's very interesting. She uses like a hundred percent open source tools to do all her design. Doesn't use any Apple or Adobe suites. And um, so, yay. Go fast. Yeah, there's a, another not so nice aspect to it. Apparently, I've scrolled down to the end, and uh, at the end, she's asking for feedback, obviously. But then she says uh, that she's disabled uh, the comments on the blog because she's about just, and I'm going to quote this I've just about reached my limit of incoming thoughtlessness and cruelty. If you have productive and respectful feedback to share, I am very interested in hearing it still. I don't think I'm too hard to get in touch with, so please do. I don't know what she was referring to because I didn't see didn't see any uh, untoward feedback in there. It's probably got de- got deleted. But like, uh, yeah, why 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 should people be jerks about stuff like this? I I I can probably imagine what what uh, what was happening there. Maybe like I don't understand why why would somebody choose this particular platform to uh, express and voice the inner jerk they possess. Uh, some people just use um, the internet as a kind of an echo chamber of they don't uh, perceive um, any negative remarks. I mean, obviously, if you are that kind of a jerk to somebody in real life, you'll see that they'll they'll either get angry and possibly, depending on the comment, would possibly... I don't know, invoke violence towards you if it's something very severe or you'll see that they're visibly um upset if if um if that's their reaction. Um whereas on the internet all you're doing is there's a comment box and you sent off the comment and is um you don't see the immediate um immediate impact of your of that comment. No, I, I okay, I get that in front uh, underneath some uh, stupid Ku Klux Klan video on YouTube, but uh here is something very constructive happening. Uh, people are actually getting together to produce something important. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm just saying the jerks will be jerks. Is uh, I effectively is what I'm saying, regardless of what the topic is. Um, I just it's really unfortunate that it's happening on something so positive as a uh, as a logo redesign. Um, and from the looks of things, it's uh, they're the 
the what they're settling on looks to be very professionally designed it looks like it's a very well designed logo all they're doing is as, as as we're saying is just refining it and saying maybe this font for the e or this font for the a looks better or whatever but they essentially have, have settled down on the on their broad logo and from the looks of things it looks very well designed so kudos to them um it's just the, the it's unfortunate that the she does feel that she has to um disable the comments below because she was receiving so much negative feedback um I mean there's there's better ways to express it than in the comment section if you do feel that negatively about it then I would uh, I'd, I would say don't really voice it in the comments below the article I mean if you're if you're that strongly if you feel that strongly about it then um, like you probably try to contact Fedora directly or something yeah if you feel that strongly about a logo and people designing a fucking logo like just lock yourself in a room and shut the fuck up <laughs> um, so the next bit of news is there's a new version of Plasma is out um, so Bluetooth devices now show their battery usage um, and Firefox 64 can now optionally use a native um, KD uh, open and save dialogues and there's uh, also improvements to discover uh, which anytime I've used discover I've I've found it not to be the most intuitive thing in the world so um, oh it's it's fine but there are better tools out there um, so any improvements to, to, to discover is only a good thing I've gone so far so far as installing um, GNOME software on, on a KDE install because GNOME software for me was just far superior to be able to uh, install software than uh, KDE discover but um, any improvements to discover is always a good thing yeah, I'm still very much on the fence between GNOME and KDE because I know I want to uh, switch from Cinnamon and Lim- Mint. Um, I just just for the sake of something new, I guess. Plus, I've had some annoyances with Mint that you know I'm not really in the mood to troubleshoot. So I think a refresh is in order. Uh, if you're into that much of a change, um, I will take a leaf out of uh, uh, the. Open SUSE challenge where I was introducing a lot of people to um, KD Plasma, and it was uh, Jason Jason uh, Evangelo is was the person, the guy who's um, doing the challenge, and he said it was his very first time just doing anything in KD. So if you're used to GTK GTK apps, I would would probably advise you to uh, maybe not go from um, Cinnamon to just stock gnome maybe go to um, something that's maybe kde neon or kubuntu or something like that because um kd plasma is actually quite quite good quite interesting but if you are like if you look if you do like the mac kind mac a little i can't even talk today if you don't if you like the mac kind of interface then gnome might be a bit more suitable from you know it's uh, i think it's a case of trying many things and then just sticking to one i was there kind of for a moment thinking that you are recommending uh shane to just leap into open suse I would I would never recommend anyone does that, <laughs> as uh, I have partaken in the challenge. And I, the, about a week into the challenge, I sent Jason a message saying, "So how long is this challenge?" And he said two weeks. And after that, I think he's changed it to actually. Uh, I I want to live in this for a while, so I'm changing the challenge to a month. I went no no nope. I I just wiped it. <laughs> so our next topic is. Um, is Linux ever going to be useful for an average non-technical user? Uh, is it ready now? Um, should an average non-technical user even try? Um, so, and I think Jason Evangelo is writing an article about um, gaming without Windows, and maybe an average non-technical user should be a- should be able to switch. So. I think this is this is our big topic for this episode. So I have some thoughts on this, but I'm going to hear your guys' thoughts first. So just to specify, he's he wrote an article on his Forbes uh, page about how gaming without Windows is still not there because uh, it's not intuitive enough, especially in like in regards to installing Nvidia drivers, and that that gave me all this idea like. Should Linux even try to be for the non-average, for the average non-technical user? 
Um, just to start it off, I think that uh, computers as they are, and that includes Macs, Windows, Linux, and Android phones are not suitable as community uh, community devices. Like the average non-technical user should should get like a non-technical appliance, like a TV, a fridge, an Xbox, and just pushing it. And if they need it for work, like say a receptionist or something like that, they shouldn't deal with Windows or Linux or even Android. Uh, they should have something that is basically just limited as an appliance to what they need to do. Not a, so a, 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 a tin client or dumb term, terminal. Not or... even that. Just a just a something that abstracts away the operating system. And if you need two buttons, then to give you just the two buttons, you know, like uh, so. For example, if you need to, if you need to run, if you want to run your games on any platform, you need to install drivers. So you need to know what drivers are. I think if you just want to play games, why should you even know this? Like you should, you should get a box that you that you download your games to from your store, and you connect the controllers and you play the game. Right? Uh, I don't think people who are not interested or who don't need the whole power of the operating system should be exposed to it. And this is not, by the way, I sound really like, uh, really uh, arrogant saying this, but this is not a knock on their intelligence. When I say receptionist, I don't mean that the people are not intelligent enough to operate a computer. I think that, uh, and it's uh, like the uptake in Facebook, for example, proves to me that people if motivated, can navigate a completely bonkers application with the skill of a of a hacker with fifty year, or fifty years of experience, right? But they should not need such motivation to operate a tool, which for most of them computers have become. And it's insane to me that we actually subject we actually give them this massive powerhouse with so many options and expect them to just use it as for the one task they need to do. I have um, obviously introduced, we've all introduced at least one person into Linux, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone I've introduced Linux to, um, it's always been a fairly seamless experience in my mind. Uh, if, if, like you said, if all you want to do is just browse the web or do something very every day, then it is possible. I think, but in, in terms of gaming, I don't know. I think it is quite easy as well. So, uh, yeah, you're right, though. You, you shouldn't expect the average user to need to know all these things in order to just use Linux or use their computer. Um, that's a, I think this is a, a much broader topic than, than just Linux. I mean, um, if, if somebody goes out and purchases, I don't know, a Dell or HP PC and says, I'm buying this because for the purposes of gaming. Um, and let's just say there's, a, I'm sure it, if it comes with a graphics card, I'm sure it will come with the, um, the drivers inbuilt into it from HP because it's, it's all packaged. But let's say if there's a, a driver update or whatever, and there's a prompt coming up saying you should install this uh, driver update, and so uh, so and for somebody who's completely non-technical, they're like, yeah, fine, whatever, just click. Um, for me, um, any time that I've been using um Ubuntu, um. It has been that easy once it's installed. They may not realize that they, for example, um, if they have an NVIDIA card, um, that they do require extra. I mean, it'll still work. It'll still um, do all the functions that they want to do, whether it's web browsing or whatever, with the free driver. But um, if they want extra frames per second out of their game, they probably would need the proprietary driver. And after a couple of clicks around in the operating system, it's pretty easy to install that. But would they know that they have to do that? Um, probably not. So I think that was the whole idea behind the um, Steam OS was taking the Linux um, platform and putting a very simple the Steam big picture mode, if anyone's ever used Steam, which is very simple. You can navigate it with um, a controller um, and it's just 
literally just saying oh, it's just your game art and saying oh yeah I want to play that and then click play and then off to the races um, that's what Steam Steam OS essentially was trying to turn any um, Steam or any Linux box into was essentially a games console because that's uh, when you're talking about the Xbox or a Playstation that's essentially what it is is you buy this thing it's, it's very simple you plug in controllers and if there's an update, it will, a big pop-up will come up on the screen saying, there's an update, click yes if you want to do the update, or no later, or whatever. Or, and if there's no update, it's like, I just want to play my game, and then just navigate the big icons and say, yep, I want to play that game. So that's that's where SteamOS was coming in. Um, but, uh, I mean, th- I think this is just a, is a general point in relation to desktop grade operating systems versus consoles or simple computing devices um i don't think it's particularly um specific to linux but what do you guys think well i think that uh, this is where linux can become well where the strength of the of linux could be kind of discovered because you can hide it so it's impossible for steam to uh basically create uh, something like SteamOS using Microsoft Windows because of licensing issues and uh, all that uh, legal commercial stuff. But is future or could future of Linux, Linux be in this appliance world where you want you want a games console? Okay, you get Linux, but with uh, the big picture mode of SteamOS slapped on top of it. You want a TV? Okay, there you go. It's Kodi, but uh, it runs on Linux, but you don't even know that. Um, do you want a smart fridge? Okay, again, uh, Linux, but it has got only only the interface that fridge can be. So uh, is I think that Linux has got the one... The, 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 that Linux is the only operating system at the moment that is capable of producing these uh these uh, that is capable to be to become a base of all of these appliances and that people might not even have a computer anymore but they might have all these connected devices and that all of them are going to be linux and that's uh probably basically what i'm thinking is it is it a good thing this possible uh, making computers into appliances. I think it is. Uh, do you guys think that uh, regular users should be exposed to uh, to an operating system in its full power? They should certainly have the choice, though. Um, th- there should be... Uh, yeah, all options should always be available. But um, it's... I think we mentioned this a long time ago, maybe back in Season 1, like, if they want to go beyond kind of the normal you know, surface user features, user-friendly kind of interfaces, clicky buttons, friendly things. If they want to go below that and do more, they should have the option. But yeah, by default, they shouldn't be expected to do that. Uh, yeah, I would agree of somewhere in the settings. I mean, if if you're an intermediate to advanced user and you're thinking this simple interface is is driving me mental because I wanted to do more. I, whatever, let's say, for, to take your example, um, uh, a, a receptionist or a professional writer or something like that who's using their computer as a tool. Um, again, this is not a slight against, uh, as Mike was saying, not a slight against um their capabilities or their intelligence level or whatever it's they their it's their focus their focus is on their job uh whether it's a receptionist answering emails or answering phone calls or a writer whose focus is writing their novel or writing their their uh, newspaper article or whatever and all they want to do is the computer is a tool yep show me the word processor and um, I want to get to my word processor as fast as possible without being distracted by anything um, then that is the functionality of the, of the computer for that person but if somebody is a coder or, or something like that and they want to tinker with it or if they're saying this simple UI is driving me mental because I don't like the look of it or I want to team it theme it up or whatever then there should be something in this in the settings and say advanced and then when you go into advanced there's a toggle saying uh, beyond this point there be dragons proceed with caution or whatever and once you toggle that then 
the um, more advanced view of the operating system um, would be exposed. I mean, it was the whole thing of let's. I'm just picking Windows XP because it's the f- thing that comes into um, into my mind immediately. Was the control panel on Windows XP was just an absolute maze of different options. Windows have since refined that of. Uh, when you go into your control panel on your version of Windows, it literally is just uh, click here. Oh, you want to uh, um, adjust your mouse sensitivity or something. So just click on mouse and there's a slider that says mouse sensitivity and you're done. But below that, there will always be, do you want more options? And I think that's a good approach to take. Uh, interesting thing is that we always keep saying, yeah, the more advanced features and options should there be, should be there for a more, more advanced user. And uh, we've seen this recently on our chat that we have very young and inexperienced users logging in and asking very interesting but advanced questions. Now, my question is, should it be? So if you have somebody who's only interested in a computer from because it does one thing that they need to do, then obviously the thing, the, the other things can be hidden. But if you have somebody who's interested in learning about computers, shouldn't they be thrown at the deep end and just, you know, because that's not your regular non-technical user. This is somebody who might not have an experience, might not be able to get out of them, but shouldn't they be just thrown in there and just, you know, forget about, forget about like, cuddling them into with, with interfaces that are not showing them the full power? Shouldn't they be thrown at the, thrown at the deep end and say, well, you want to learn how this works, so put in the work and just, uh, you know, get yourself, uh, get yourself acquainted with the system. And if you can't fix it, you probably shouldn't be using it. Um, I, get, I can kind of get where you're coming from, but I'm just going to exaggerate your point for, um, for effect. Um, yeah, I don't think... Um, somebody who's brand new to Linux and is curious about Linux, and we should say, "Yep, Linux for scratch from scratch is for you." Um, there is uh, shades of subtlety here. Um, I for the for the masses, um, Ubuntu or something that's that's very user friendly is probably the best thing to do, and I it's because it's everything is on a bell curve. I mean. For the vast majority, um, Ubuntu is is catering for its what it, it's is the peak of the bell curve. It is ignoring the outliers on either side of of um. Well, some might argue that it's leaning more towards the brand new user, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But it's also accommodating the average use the average Linux user as they perceive it as well. So you can do read pretty powerful things you can be a professional coder on ubuntu you can do everything pretty powerful things on ubuntu uh what some criticisms is 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 that for maybe two more tinkerers and things like that who want to do everything from scratch and they want to change absolutely everything in not just the theme or something i mean by changing the entire interface of the altogether like going from Ubuntu which is stock with GNOME to changing it to i3 or some other uh, window manager and people who have that knowledge are able to do that on Ubuntu um, so it's a good it's a good general platform um, but I do not wouldn't necessarily advocate saying here's this really difficult thing you're new to Linux I'm going to show you the really difficult thing and just throw you in at the deep end um. This is the thing. You see, I, I kind of learned Linux this way. I uh, There was no one around me using it, right? So I would install Ubuntu, uh, use it, try to play with it, broke it. If I could fix it, fine. If I couldn't, reinstall and again and again and again. And I got to gradually better. And I think that's a valid learning curve, you know, rather than uh, telling somebody, okay, you're new, you start on uh, you start on elementary, once you get used to it, you can go to Ubuntu, and then you can go to Mint, and then you can go to blah, 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 and eventually end up making it from scratch. I think it's not it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a good idea to say, this is good for the new user. This is definitely good for some segment of the new users. There are people who are 
using Linux who, who just want the elementary experience and they will forever stick with it and it's going to be full good for them. But we should also recognize that uh, some people like to learn from the difficult. You know, there are people uh, and there are actually schools of like teaching who start teaching you computers uh, by learning you C rather than telling you this is a keyboard, this is a mouse. Um, I also had a similar um, experience when I was with Ubuntu was uh, I want to do this. I wonder if this works. And it could have possibly been that I broke it and it was the case of uh, I will look at the forms or look at the help forms and if they're able to solve it with a command or whatever. Um, but for me, it was there was nothing... Uh, er- everything was disposable about it so I could as as an option always go back and just wipe it and start again That, but that was my le- learning process but for having conversations with people not everyone is, is like that and con- conversely there's as you're mentioning in, in the chat there's people who are brand new to Linux and are asking very basic questions and literally a week later is okay how do I install Arch Um. I was like, oh, whoa, uh, that, for me, that seemed to be um, t- taking a large g- leap, but maybe they're well capable of taking that leap. Um, but that's that one individual. I think uh, Ubuntu is going after, as I said, the majority of the bell curve rather than um, focusing on the outliers, either the more advanced users or the, the really uh, new users. Um, and... It, as I said, I seem uh, I know I'm repeating myself, but they I some would say they are catering more towards the new user. That's right, they are, but they're also not ignoring the the middle ground of the majority of the users. Uh, also, don't think we uh, like why you want to specifically. We I I I don't think we kind of uh, mention or you know it's not just Ubuntu no they are they are going by the people who who use them more at most as they as you said I'm more I'm more thinking say it is it is generally uh, whenever you listen to podcasts and read about Linux and watch YouTube video it's pretty much obvious that the general consensus consensus is some distros and I don't think Ubuntu is necessarily it or isn't right but some distros are for beginners some distros and desktop environments are for people who are more recommended and I'm thinking that maybe this this idea or like basically stating this idea as as a fact is as hurtful or and as like uh, as it is helpful because you know, as 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 I said, not everybody is the same. So maybe we shouldn't say we sh- we shouldn't say these are a beginners distros because they are not. Like there are people with a lot of experience who wouldn't be able to sit down with with uh, elementary or and, and people with no experience who wouldn't be able to sit down with elementary and use it just because it's not their style, right? There are people who would start with Linux from the command line and never even touch a GUI because that's how, how they want to experience computers and it's their, their way of interacting with them. So maybe I'm thinking boxing up, like saying Ubuntu is for this kind of people and elementary for these and open user, no one should be using this. <laughs> that, you know, that's, uh, that was a bad joke anyway. But I think that's, that's, that's uh, a bad idea. So now we will move on to the boner sections quite real quick. So, uh, Mike, you have a boner? Yeah, I uh, recently discovered a library for Python. Uh, it's called Tabulate. A uh, link's going to be in the show notes, and fuck me, it's good. It's uh, basically, if you want to print something into the command line from a Python script and the data is tabular, you have got this little utility that prints it for you very nicely, so you can have... Uh, you can have uh, Print you can have printed it uh, with like in a fancy grid, or it outputs it in a format that you can copy and paste into Jira or into Markdown or into you know other 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 platforms, and it's formatted for that specific platform, and it's basically amazing. The website for it looks a bit janky and and not nice, but uh, the product itself or the library itself is amazing. Yeah, my boner is uh, the latest version of Blender. Um, I recently got this and uh, it's a big improvement on the UI on previous versions because 
I've been struggling with Blender for many years and uh, this one just there are f- several improvements that just work they're cu- they're quite subtle but they're you know there's just some menus have been simplified and you know the overall experience is slightly less scary um and I was able to just pick it up and use it and I was you know I was trying to make some make something in Blender and you know it was quite a good experience uh I so yeah I really like the latest version um I so much I don't know about it and I'm still learning I'm still most definitely a novice but uh, the Blender quest continues. Um, my boner for this episode is actually Lineage OS because I have been fecking around with various mobile devices, um, including uh, I ha- one that have Sailfish OS on, but uh, that's for uh, a topic for um, quite possibly for another episode. So, but for Lineage OS is for anyone who's familiar with Science and Mod, which is the OG custom ROM. Um, I think it was one of the first, if not the very first um, Android custom ROM that came out there. Um, Lineage OS is the spiritual successor and continuation of the Science and Mod project. So it's it's just taking stock um, Android and doing their own custom tweaks, niceties here and there. And it's actually really good. Um, and it's also a way of upgrading your, your, I was going to say your computer. <laughs> so uh, 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 your phone is a mobile computer. Um, upgrading your phone. If your phone has been abandoned by the manufacturer in terms of Android updates, if your if your phone is is saying, oh, you can only get up to Android seven, or you can only get up to Android eight because, uh, and you're clicking on the updates, and there are no updates. It could be the case of somebody has done a port of the latest version of Lady's OS for your phone, and it will be maintained with the, all the latest security patches and all the latest and even if you all you want is just new features and the the fact that it's, you're getting the latest security patches is just a bonus is the, I, I mean I highly commend the guys in Ninja West for resurrecting old devices uh, and maintaining um, the support for old devices um, there are official ports which you can get on their website but if you go to XDA developers, there's a lot of unofficial ports. I mean, my phone is the essential phone and it's not officially supported by the guys in Lineage OS. But if you go on XDA forums, there's a guy who's ported it over and I'm running it now on my phone and it's running pretty well. So my boner for this episode is Lineage OS. So one event that I think is worthwhile to point out is the Global Diversity Day is swinging its way around to Dublin on the 2nd of March uh, it seems to be for a couple of hours it's from uh, half 11 to half 2 on the 2nd of March loads just looking down through the website here there does seem to be some really interesting speakers and I think it's a worthwhile thing to check out the tickets appear to be free um, just from looking at the website there's a button to book your free ticket um, I do not know if spaces are limited or um, if you don't have a free ticket, you won't be able to gain access. But their contact details are on their website. They have Twitter and uh, whatnot. So if you want to ask those kind of questions, I'm sure they will be able to uh, accommodate those queries for you. Uh, so yeah, once again, it's in a very worthwhile event is coming up on the 2nd of March, which is the Global Diversity Day. And I think that is coming towards the end of this podcast. So I will let you guys know where you can contact us. So we are on Telegram, which is linuxlads.com slash Telegram. We're also on Twitter at, uh, at linuxlads. I believe Linux Labs and Pot Mastodon. Um, and if you forget any of these, they will all be clickable links in the show notes. So you can just click on them. Um, our email address is show at linuxlads.com. If you have any kind of feedback, positive or negative, we do take uh, constructive criticism. <laughs> Feel free to email us on show at linuxlads.com. And we do appear in person. Um, and that link will also be in the show notes. So I think we'll wrap things up. 
Um, thank you for listening. And I have been Connor. I've been Mike. And I've been Shane. Shane.